If you have a Bible with you, I'd encourage you to open it to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We'll be starting there in just a moment. Just repeat what we've already said this morning, what's already been announced. If you're with us, we're so pleased that you are. It's good to be with the family here at Lakeside. It's good to see visitors. Uh, Paige and I actually have some, some special visitors visiting with us this morning from uh, Indiana, the, our original home. <laughs> Uh, and it, it, it was really good to see them. I uh, wish we'd be able to spend more time together, but they were just passing through, and uh, I'm glad that they were able to stop by and, and be with us. But uh, all that just to say, make sure, you, make sure you definitely get to talking to them because I'm sure that they have a lot of only good things to say about the two of us. So <laughs> besides that, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, we'll be starting there in just a moment, as, I, as I've already said. If you've been here with us for the past couple of weeks, for the past few weeks, what we've been going through is a series of lessons that are all about doing everything in God's name. And we, and our thematic verse has been Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, that whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Um, and, and so that... We truly believe that, and, and we're just going to continue down this uh, thought process as we continue to, as we conclude uh, our series in the next uh, coming weeks. But maybe a secondary thematic verse that we could look at is in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 15, as we've been mentioning the past couple of lessons, going through some of these thoughts, Paul says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. And how do we accomplish that? Accurately handling the word of truth. And we've been using that also as kind of a foundational verse um, as we've been trying to figure out how do we establish authority. We've already made the case that everything we do needs to be guided by the authority of God and that God has all authority. Especially the last two weeks, we focused on the fact that uh, uh, or on the question of how do we establish that. We can know God's will. He's made it so clear to us. We've already talked about the commands that he gives us or the direct statements that he gives us, and that is the clearest of communication uh, that we have, uh, even when it just comes to how we talk to one another. I just want to continue through that thought process, specifically focusing on uh, examples, divinely approved examples. How Are, are these... Uh, authoritative as we've been talking about uh, when we see them in the scriptures. Well, I want to try and uh, make that case this morning just with three points. And we're going to kind of basically say, go through the same line of thought as we did last week. This is uh, one way that we communicate to one another. And we can't forget that because this is also a way that God communicates to us his authority. And I think it's important to remember because a lot of times people will come to the scriptures and they essentially get to the... Uh, the, the thought of, well, God's ways are higher than our ways. And yes, I completely agree. But they'll use a verse like Isaiah chapter 55 just to make the case that, well, we can't know. Well, we've already made the case that we can. Uh, and so obviously that's a poor application from that verse. It's, it's actually just, just false, a false application from that verse. We can know God's will. Our goal, our, our mission is to try and figure out what his will actually is through these different forms of communication. And as we've already laid out, this will take honesty, it'll take common sense, and just basic uh, understanding of how we communicate to one another. And so we're just going to go throughout that same thought process as we look at examples today. And really, uh, just from the very start, we do still learn by examples today. In fact, uh, you could say that examples are authoritative. Um, especially at certain times. And I wanted to start by just looking at the example of Jesus in a couple of different areas or circumstances. In Luke chapter 4, over in Luke chapter 4, here is one instance, we can't get into the entire uh, passage here, but here is one instance where Jesus is um, uh, speaking to a group of people. He's just read from Isaiah and Obviously, they're amazed by the things that he has uh, just read from the prophet, um, basically indicating that he is the fulfillment of everything that they've been reading about. And so, picking up in verse 23 of Luke chapter 4, this is what Jesus says. He said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you, in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land. Now, what is he doing? He's giving them uh, an example. He's going back to some of their history that they would all know and understand to make a point. So he's, he's, he's setting this up with an example, talking about Elijah. 
and about the famine in the land. And in verse 26, yet Elijah was sent to none of them, none of the Israelites, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. In verse 27, and there were many lepers in Israel in the, in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with, rage as, filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him off down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way. Now, again, there's a lot of different things to, that you could look at with this passage. I just wanted to kind of give you uh, the conclusion of the matter, what happens after they actually hear this, uh, what Jesus has to say. But why did they get so mad? Well, because he gives two different examples, two illustrations, to make a point, to prove something, um, to, to make the case ultimately that Israel at this point in time uh, could learn from those examples that they're also not in uh, the, the greatest of relationships with God right now. And that's not God's fault, but rather it's Israel's fault. And I think that um, you, you can even see that just indicated by the examples he's used, what were the circumstances? Well, it was a time of God's judgment to a degree, especially when you look at the famine and, and the kingship of Ahab uh, in the northern kingdom, or, or, or the kingship of Ahab, rather, uh, and, and Elijah being sent to him. And so all of that, just to say, Jesus uses both of these illustrations to make the case that it, you still struggle with the same problem today. And, and so he gives them proof using some of these examples that they have. Now, I want to go a little bit further. Go over to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Here's another example where Jesus uses an example to teach something. And, and to teach something authoritatively, no less. In John chapter 13, in verse 12 beginning, it says, So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? Now, if you know this story, you understand that this is when Jesus, it, it's, the cross is looming just hours away, and he is uh, at, at the dinner table with, with the disciples. Uh, it's, it's also the Passover as well. And so there, it's at the same time, but he gets up and he washes their feet, and this is what he asks them and, and teaches them afterward. In verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. And now we're actually going to come back to this in just a moment uh, in, in, our next, uh, in the next point. But just from the very beginning, what I want to make clear is that as you look at the examples specifically that Jesus uses, in one instance, I think what we find in Luke chapter 4 is you, you prove things through examples, but also what you find is Jesus also shows people and illustrates to people how he wants them to act, how he wants them to be, the kind of character he wants them to develop and take on. Um, and, and I think you even see that specifically uh, when Paul talks about 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But, but all of that, Jesus is trying to teach them, you need to do what I have done to you. Yes. Uh, he doesn't, he's not saying that, you know, what you think that I am actually greater than I am the teacher, that I'm Lord. N no, you, you have it wrong. No, that's correct. And yet the greater is serving the lesser. So what are they supposed to get? Well, you, the apostles, they will be sent out and they are going to do a lot as we see in Acts, the, uh, the Acts of the Apostles. But with all of that, they are to serve in the same way. And Paul is such a good example of that as he's trying to imitate Christ as he tries to become all things to all men, and as he will suffer whatever need be for the sake of Christ and for the sake of spreading the kingdom. And so, um, again, I just wanted to start from the very beginning with Jesus and, and look at how he tries to communicate some authoritative lessons and applications. Uh, again, we'll come back to John chapter 13, so you might put a marker there. But finally with this point, hopefully I've made the case somewhat through these couple of passages that examples are expected to be followed, specifically God-pleasing examples. I was reading a, a, a book about authority not too long ago, and as he was talking about the examples that we have in the scriptures, one question he had, and really I think this is probably one of the main questions we need to ask, not necessarily are examples binding, but what God-pleasing example would we not want to follow? Because ultimately what you find throughout the scriptures are examples of people who are pleasing God and then examples of people who just simply are not pleasing God. And we want to make that distinction of why, how was it that they were pleasing God and why was this group of people not doing so? 
um, what, what is the distinction? And I think we can definitely see the distinction clearly as you look throughout the, the Bible. But just looking at Paul's example now, over in Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, <clears throat> beginning in verse uh, 16, and that's kind of starting in the middle of a sentence, but Philippians chapter 3 and verse 16. Oh, goodness. I just I cannot turn. My, my fingers are too dry. I can't turn in my Bible. All right, Philippians chapter 3 in verse 16. He says, However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Uh, however, uh, or in verse 17, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. And so Paul looks at his example, and he's actually pointing to himself and says, has enough confidence to say, Listen, I have walked in a manner that I want you to follow. Now, just from the outset, I wonder if, if we can say the same thing. But, but over in chapter 4 of Philippians, the same epistle, but in verse 9, he just, I think, reemphasizes the fact, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Not to mention what we've already mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And I think that Paul can confidently say that because he truly lived that way. Uh, and he wasn't just saying it as some empty platitude or truism. No, he meant it when he said it. Now, that's a side point. The main point that we're making as we look at his, just Paul's example alone, being an apostle of Christ, is even from Paul's words, it is clear that he is saying, the, these, these things that you have seen in us, not just me, but the rest of the apostles as well, these are things that you are to follow. These are authoritative. And if you don't, you're actually going against the, the standard of Christ. Just look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. A, a few verses here, so I put it on the screen, but 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, in verse 6 beginning, he says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tr tradition which you receive from us. So, in the first instance, we actually have a command being given. But then you move on in verse 7. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. Because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model, or you could say an example, for you so that you would follow our example. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Now again, you have some you know, the word order and command. They, there are some commandments that they laid out to the brethren there. But what did they supply that with also? They gave themselves as examples, as illustrations to the people, to their brethren, in how they are to act. And Paul goes so far as to say, listen, if they are going to walk in an unruly manner, in an undisciplined manner, in a manner that was not seen by us, they are walking away from the Lord. And you need to take note of those people. He goes so far to say in 2 Thessalonians 3. If, if you just read on a little bit more, he gets even more emphatic on that point. But all of this just to make the, the case that examples absolutely can be authoritative. Now, that doesn't just immediately solve the problem of, okay, well, what do we take from each example? And is every example, therefore, authoritative? Or are there some examples that aren't necessarily authoritative? Well, I want to try and answer that with a few... And, and, you know, these aren't the only things that we could say, but I wanted to just try and s s uh, go through this lesson in this main point here with just a few general rules that I think helps us in interpreting what God wants us to interpret from the ex uh, examples that, he, that would be pleasing to him throughout the scriptures. And first of all, examples are, are they have to harmonize with the rest of God's word. They, they're clearly not binding when they contradict scripture. And again, all of these general boiled down rules uh, uh, in how to interpret these examples, I think that they are just so commonsensical that it almost, for, for many in the room to this morning, many people will just think, well, this, I mean, we, you didn't have to say all this. Again, I would just say what I did last week. Even if something as clear as a command is being slanted when people come and read the direct statements that God makes, even something as direct as baptism now saves you, people will read that out loud from their own lips and they'll look up and say well I just don't agree with that well I mean come on how much clearer can you get and so even though this may be clear to some we have to be able to make the defense of how we have come to these conclusions and it's not by some random creed that man has come up with but rather it is just by simple logic that we come to these conclusions uh, these conclusions now 
uh, in, in re reference to this first point here, that examples must harmonize with the rest of God's word. Uh, just one example that we could look at is in Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, as Paul talks about an apostle, an apostle of Christ. He talks about Peter and an example that Peter himself had set. Now, let's just read what he says about this. He says, but when, Pef when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. In verse 13, the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? So here is an example of, of an apostle of Christ doing something that I think is just, just within the context. Clearly, not what uh, God would want us to do. It's not a God-pleasing example being set forth, right? Now, just from the outside, I think it's clear enough. But, but one thing that you could look at, just kind of forgetting what Paul says at the very end there, if you just saw that example, would there be enough uh, evidence just from the gospel to understand that this is not the kind of example that is to be followed? Well, you look over at a passage like James chapter 2, and we won't read the whole thing, but it's specifically in verses 1 and 9. What does James say at the beginning of chapter 2? But My brother, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Skipping down to verse 9, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And there are other passages that we could go to, but here is a passage that makes clear what Peter was doing in showing favoritism and showing partiality to a degree and, and hypocrisy. Here we have another example. We have another uh, even command and statement made uh, in another part of the New Testament that shows us that is not compatible with the gospel. That's not compatible to the, uh, nor is it conducive at all, to the evangelism, to the life that a Christian is supposed to live. Um, and that is just clear from other portions of Scripture. And again, you could look at many other examples, but, but here is just one basic example to make the point. If you have an example that it clearly goes against God's commandments, well, then obviously that's not one that we are going to hold very firmly. Rather, it's one that we are going to hold firmly to the degree of we do not want to look like that. And so I would say that, that even from the outset, it seems pretty clear. But moving on past that, I would also just add that incidental details are not the same as the focus of the example. Now, what, what do I mean by that? I think that we must discern the focus, the purpose of the example given from the incidental details, particularly looking at John chapter 13. Let's, let's look back at John chapter 13. Now, we've, we just read this a moment ago. I want to read it one more time, but with this thought in mind. Now, in verse 12... When he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Now let me just ask, what in this example, what is the focus of this example? Is it feet washing? Is it that we are all, even today, supposed to make sure that we get all of the brethren together and start washing their feet? That's clearly not the focus of this example. If you think that's the focus of this example, you've completely missed the point that the Lord, God manifest in the flesh, was trying to make. What was his main goal here? I want you to be a servant like me. That's the main focus. And if you miss it, you've missed the lesson. He is trying to get across to his disciples that you need to follow this example and be a servant, not just by washing people's feet, but it needs to go a lot further than that, and it needs to go a lot deeper than that. But, but you know, maybe some people, I would say, just trying to be facetious as, as they look at, you know, oh, can examples really be authoritative? Oh, 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 so that just means, I guess that just means that all we have to do to, to be servants is washing. No, of course not. But the point of that example was that we are to be servants just like our Lord is a servant. And, and you know... Going outside of, of just an example from the scriptures, in everyday communication, we get this. I remember one time specifically, uh, I was being taught by my, my, uh, my, my dad how to, you know, drive a car. And he would said, you know, watch me. And, and, and he would often have to say, no, don't look at anything else. No, you watch me while we're driving. And you see exactly how I turn and how I back in. And specifically when we were talking about how to turn, 
Uh, one thing that I noticed about really both my, my mother and my dad is that when they turned, they would have an underhand grip on the wheel and they would turn like, like so. Well, in driver's, ed, in driver's ed course, they ended up telling us that that is actually something you're not supposed to do. And it's actually pretty, um, it was pretty emphatic when they were talking about this and showed a couple of pictures because what you end up having is if you get in a wreck and your hand is like that, the airbag comes out and it's just a gnarly, it, it is almost an unspeakable picture. Uh, and so you don't want to turn like that. Now, my, my, my parents taught me how to turn the car in this way. So that means I must, I must turn the car with an underhand grip rather than just turning it like a normal person. Was that the focus of what they were trying to get across? No, no. If, if that was all I focused on, well, then I'm going to have to go in the car with them again because that's, that's often what my dad would say. You were not paying attention. We're going to have to do it again. We're just going to do it again until you get the point. And what was the point? How do you turn safely? Are you looking at your surroundings? Are you making sure that as you turn, you're looking where you're going? Not necessarily the, the hand placement, but are, are you doing this safely? And you could think of many other examples. There's an example that I was reading about just, just the other day in a book uh, about, about this very thought. And, and, and he said, if I'm teaching someone how to do something on a computer and I'm sitting in a certain way, I have my feet crossed. Well, is the focus of this example that I'm setting for this person that they must do this on the computer with their feet crossed? No, no, no. That's not the point, obviously. And so just, again, the reason I keep talking about common sense is not to be reductive or you know, belittle anyone, but it is just so very fundamental and, and logical that really it's not that, I don't think it's that hard to understand when we're talking about the authoritative nature of, of certain examples. And so we need to be able to make sure that we understand the focus of what uh, the Lord is actually trying to teach us. Um, going beyond that, I think just actually just kind of right in line with that the author's intent overrides the audiences or our own now someone could come up to an example and they could make all kind of random accusations or random applications that have nothing to do with what God is trying to teach us now I want to go to one example specifically in Matthew chapter 12 Matthew chapter 12 <clears throat> And we're just going to read the. Uh, we're going to read a few verses here. Matthew chapter twelve, beginning in verse one. I want to get the context of, of the argument here, as Jesus and his disciples are accused by some. It says the beginning of Matthew chapter twelve. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, "Look, your disciples do not do what is not lawful to do on a Sabbath." But he said to them, "Have you not read what David did when he became hungry?" He and his companions, how he entered the house of God and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests alone. <clears throat> or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are, in a, and are innocent? But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. <clears throat> now, I wanted to get the, the whole context of this because uh, we're not going to be talk, we're not going to talk about everything and, and focus on everything in here. But what is the point that Jesus is trying to make? Now, some people would look at the examples that Jesus uses to, to make a point to try and prove something to these people that are accusing him and his disciples of, of breaking the, the, the law. And, and he uses David. And there's a lot of debate on whether or not David actually sinned or not. I'm not even going to get into that. Either way is the point that Jesus is making is that, you know what, using this example, you can break God's law. Listen, it's, it's, it's no, it doesn't mean anything, and it really doesn't matter if you go against what God has actually spoken. Is that what he's teaching? No matter what you think about David, is that what Jesus is trying to teach? A or Jesus is trying to teach? Absolutely not. What he is trying to indicate is that you are hypocrites. You look at us, we're not even, they're not even breaking the law because this is actually provided for in the law that if, if you were hungry, you were allowed. Now, if you took a sickle to it, well, then you're trying to harvest someone else's, someone else's uh, field. But if you just grab something to, to, uh, specifically when you're thinking about the provision of the, the poor in, in the land or the sojourner in the land, that was provided by the law. So they weren't breaking any law. But he goes over to these examples to say, you won't deal with anything like this. Really, you have a double standard because you love David and you love the priests, but you hate me and my disciples. And that's why you're bringing this up. Because if you really cared about this, well, then maybe you would think about these things. And so the focus, was, the point that Jesus was not, the point that Jesus was not making was, you know what? 
Because David and because the priests, they break the Sabbath, well, that just means we can do whatever we want on the Sabbath. Absolutely not. And honestly, I would, I would say that that's a dishonest approach into trying to interpret what an example is trying to teach us. So somebody could come in and they could say, uh, when, when looking at something that the Holy Spirit has, has given to us, they could say, well, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. What is, what is God wanting us to learn here? That's all that I care about. All these other things, we're going to let those aside. What is the point that God is trying to teach? And that is what we will stick with. Uh, and we won't go any further, really, what I would say is in silence and try to make a, a, a more and more really random or arbitrary speculative uh, arguments on that matter. Well, finally with this, uh, I think an, another very important thing to remember is that context does matter. As we already uh, referred to in the beginning of the lesson, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 1, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And he could confidently say that. Now, when it comes to that imitation, does that mean absolutely every single decision that Paul ever made, we have to do it exactly the same way in our lives? Now, again, I, I understand this is probably just very, this is very simple, but that's really all I want to do when I preach. I, I want to make sure that I make very simple points that from the youngest to the oldest of us, we can all understand. But is, is, is Paul trying to say, he talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, specifically to those people in, in uh, Corinth, he says, you know, for you, for you all, it's probably going to be better that you do not get married at this time because of the current distress he talks about. Now, he himself is an example of one who didn't get married, and specifically for the cause of Christ, specifically because he didn't want to be... <laughs> uh, he didn't want to be distracted. Uh, his words, not mine, but, uh, but still, incidentally, they are the same. But he didn't want to be distracted. He wanted to be completely devoted to the Lord Jesus. And so he didn't get married. And that's even something he talks about, not just 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, but a, a couple of times throughout that letter. Now, does that mean that today, if we get married, we're sinning? He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. No. There are specific things that we do imitate because they do carry with them the authority of, the, of, of a, an apostle, one of the sent out of Jesus. And there are other things that fall into that realm of th th this has nothing to do with the point that he was trying to get across. And specifically, as you look at a chapter like chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, uh, he even makes the case that this is specifically for a, a, uh, their current distress, for their current circumstances, not just a universal uh, command and, and a statement that he's making. So... All of these things, I think, matter as we're trying to interpret what the scriptures teach us, specifically when it comes to the examples, the illustrations that we are given. Now, what I want to do with the remaining time is just use all of those just boiled down uh, rules, those boiled down um, helpful anecdotes as we read through something like Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. I want to try and see what this looks like as you look at just one passage in particular, Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> beginning in verse 1. It says, after the uproar had ceased, <clears throat> Paul sent for the disciples, and when he had exhorted them and taken his leave of them, he left to go to Macedonia. When he had gone through those districts and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. And there he spent three months, and when a plot was formed against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And he was accompanied by Sopater of Berea, the son of Phyrus, and by Aristarchus and Segundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy, and Tychicus, and Trophimus of Asia. But these had gone on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. We served from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came to them at Troas within five days, and there we stayed seven days. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. Therefore, or th there were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered together, and there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and fell upon him, and after embracing him, he said, Do not be troubled, for his life is in him. When he had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak and then left. They took away the boy alive and were greatly comforted. Now, I specifically want to focus on a couple of verses here in Acts chapter 20. In uh, verses 7 through 9, there are a few things that we learn through, the, through this example uh, that we hold firmly even today. And there are a few things that we uh, see in an example form, but that we don't take authoritatively. Now, I want to just, again, use those principles that we talked about earlier to try and uh, see... 
if, if it's really maybe as simple or maybe uh, as complicated as, as others would try to indicate this is in interpreting Scripture. Now, first of all, what do we learn from this passage? We're going to talk about what we learn and what we don't learn. The first thing, or one of the things that we learn, is the purpose of why they met together. You see specifically highlighted there that we were gathered together for what purpose? To break bread. And you actually see this kind of uh, phraseology used constantly throughout the New Testament, specifically talking about the Lord's Supper, the communion. Uh, And so we understand what he's talking about. Now, he says this is the purpose. This is the focus. We were gathered together to break bread. And I think that that's the the reason that they stayed, so that way they could be with these disciples here at Troas to uh, uh, to make sure that they could um, take partake of the Lord's Supper in this way. And so what are they doing? They're obeying the example that Jesus set in Matthew chapter 26 as he is breaking bread with his disciples and telling them about this, this, uh, this new feast that he is implementing and that he was going to implement with his death, burial, and resurrection. And, and so what they're doing here is they are meeting together to obey that law, to actually do uh, what Jesus has, has asked of them to do. Now, not only do we have the purpose, not only do we learn the purpose, but we also have the frequency. We have the when this is to take place. It says on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread. That is, that is a, those two thoughts are connected. They came together on the first day of the week to do this. And again, this is another thing that you see all throughout the New Testament. And so here, once more, we're just talking about the context of whenever you see this idea of breaking bread together, partaking of the Lord's Supper, the context suggests in every, in every rite that this was done on the first day of the week. And there is absolutely no example where it talks about doing this uh, on any other day or, uh, or really any other frequency. And so... Once more, we we appeal to the context, but we also just appeal to what this says when talking about when they meet together. It is it is uh, th- that only uh, it is the only example we have, and it is a consistent example we have of when to partake. And you can see that all the way back from Acts chapter two and verse forty two, and moving onward. Now, what are a few things that we do not learn? Now. Uh, there are a couple things that I want to mention about this. First of all, and we've already kind of indicated this, but the location is not authoritative here. And that's not just because we are, you know, whimsically just arbitrarily drawing lines, but rather, look at what it says. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered together. Now, we're going to get to the context in just a moment. Uh, or, or rather, the, the context of the rest of the New Testament. But specifically in the context of this, this passage, well, why, why was it describing, why is Luke writing down that they met together in the upper room? I, what's the purpose? Well, I think for one thing, he's telling, he's giving this anecdote to show you what happens to Eutychus. I mean, it, it go, I mean, if you just read through that and you saw that Eutychus died and fell and he died, well, what, what's the point? Well, he's, he's already told us that they met in an upper room and he fell asleep into a deep sleep and he fell from that windowsill and he landed on the ground and died. And, uh, and Paul comes and, and brings him back to life. But so just from the context of the, of the passage here, I think we see that indicated. But not just that, you see frequently throughout the New Testament, through examples, that they didn't just meet in upper rooms. You have just, here's just a few examples. You have uh, in, uh, or, or in Romans chapter 16, rather, in verse 5, that they met in houses. You see that they met in schools in Acts chapter 19 and verse 9, and you see that they even met outside when you look at the, the few disciples that were meeting together in Acts chapter 16 and verse 13. And so here are several examples, but not every example has this specific uh, detail, what is an incidental detail of them meeting in the upper room. Now, does that mean that we're saying you couldn't do it in an upper room? You could. I mean, to a degree, I guess we kind of do that every Sunday because you got that downstairs. So. But, but that's an incidental, isn't it? And so that's not the point that, that, uh, uh, that it was written down. It was not to say that you can only partake of the Lord's Supper in an upper room. Rather, we have all throughout the New Testament more examples of, what exa- of, of you know, where it can be done. And it's not specified as to the uh, only one place that it may be done. Now, moving on beyond that, just in looking at the context of the passage once more, um, I, I do think that this incidental detail is specifically tied to Eutychus and not necessarily what it's talking about with uh, the Lord's Supper. I will say one last thing about this, one thing that we do not learn, and y'all may be thankful about this, but we do not learn from this passage 
that the preacher must preach until midnight. We don't take from this. We don't look at this passage and see this example being given. In fact, it's not just till midnight. It even says that after that they had taken up the boy alive, he preached till daybreak. Are y'all ready to be here for the next 24 hours? Well, a little less than 24 hours. Well, why not? Well, that's not an authoritative statement. It's an incidental. It's telling us what happened in this story. It's telling us what Paul did because Luke is just giving us, the, again, the Acts of the Apostles. And so he starts with Peter predominantly at the beginning, and then he goes into the journeys of Paul and the teachings of Paul, and you focus on the spreading of the kingdom. Now, here is just an incidental detail that's given. Now, we very, we very easily look at that detail and say, well, obviously, this is not saying that Luke is, needs to be up here until midnight and longer. Why do we do that? Because of common sense. Very, very honestly. Frankly, it's because of common sense, and this is how we logically speak to one another. And we can absolutely dis discern what is the focus of this example and what is just the incidental detail. What are we supposed to take from this example and what are we not? And when you see an example like Peter in Galatians chapter 2, clearly, we're not going to follow that example. We're going to follow the God-pleasing examples that we have all throughout the scriptures. Well... I just want to end uh, the, our thoughts this morning on this with the same question we began with. Are examples binding? And as we've indicated all throughout, that may not be the best question to start with. Rather, the best question would be, what God-pleasing example do we not want to follow? I think that's the best question to ask. Is there one example throughout the New Testament that would be uh, pleasing to God and, and that would make God happy that you would look at and say, well, I don't think I really want to do that. I think that this room, I know that this room is filled with Bible believers, people that respect God's word and want to do everything they can to please him. And so I know that no one would have that kind of attitude. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, as we said many times throughout this morning, as Paul says, imitate me as, our, as I imitate Christ. Our goal in this life is to imitate Christ's example as closely as we possibly can. Now, the question is, are we doing that this morning? Are we truly looking to try and please God? Are we truly looking to try and change our lives to more so look like our master, more so look like our teacher? If you are a Christian and you feel like maybe you've kind of fallen astray, guess what? We all have. But we can correct that. There, as we've already seen with Peter, even after, even after that terrible moment where he betrays the Lord even further by denying him three times. You'd think, oh, he'll, he'll, he'll never go back again. No, he even struggles after that fact. But even at that point, he can come back and he can repent. And by, by what we see throughout the New Testament, he did. You can too. If you're not a Christian, if this has never been your goal, you can make that goal, uh, you can start walking towards that goal this, eve, this, this very morning. It's not going to, it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy, and it doesn't mean that everything is going to change just automatically, but you can develop, you can cultivate that desire. If we can help you in that, why don't you come forward and let your need be made known as we stand and as we sing.